If I said the word conflict and asked you to word associate with that, you'd probably come up with a lot of negative connotations. Generally, people tend to think about conflict as negative and something that should be avoided. But conflict is not inherently negative. For instance, competing for a prize is a form of conflict. It is the way that conflict is handled that can be the issue. Conflict is inevitable and will always be present in organizational settings. So it is really important to know how to manage conflict and communicate within conflict effectively. Is conflict always bad? What are the different kinds of conflicts and how are relational and content issues linked? Note that process conflict is not in our book. It's just in the lecture. Know the steps of the principled negotiation method and understand the four horsemen and their antidotes. Understand the strategies of conflict resolution Interpersonal conflict is defined as a felt struggle between two or more interdependent individuals over perceived incompatible differences in beliefs, values, and goals, or over differences in desires for esteem, control, and connectedness. That definition has a lot going on. Breaking it down, interpersonal conflict has four aspects. First, we have struggle. This is probably what you think of when you hear conflict. There is a struggle, interaction of some sort, or opposition. Second, we have interdependence. In interpersonal conflict, the parties involved must be interdependent in some way. In other words, only if what one party does affects the other party or parties is there a potential for conflict. Third is differences. I would clarify this as perceived differences. The parties must perceive that the other party is interfering with their ability to accomplish goals, live out beliefs or values, etc. That perception is key, and the perception doesn't have to be accurate for there to be conflict. For instance, two people are up for the same race, and both can get it. There's no conflict. Their goals are not interfering with each other. But what if one perceives or maybe misunderstands that both cannot get the same race? then conflict is possible. Note, even if two people are up for the same raise and only one can get it, that doesn't mean the conflict will be hostile, but they are still struggling with competing goals. Fourth, we have feeling. This is the affective or emotional element. There are feelings involved in the conflict. I want to dive a little deeper into this element of conflict. Our understanding of emotions during conflict comes from Darwin's research. He found that animals who feel safe display positive emotions, while those that feel threatened display negative emotions. Based on this logic, it would make sense that we're more likely to react positively when conflict is handled constructively and both individuals are respected, but react negatively when we feel like we are being attacked during conflict. Think about a time when you've been in conflict and felt angry. Perhaps that anger happened because you felt disrespected, or maybe you were embarrassed about something. Anger is what we call a basic or core emotion. There are, fi there are five other basic emotions, and these are disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. With a core emotion like anger, there are times when other emotions or unmet needs are impacting anger, and we use anger to hide raw feelings, like feeling disrespected or embarrassment below the surface. You can see this in the, this anger iceberg from the Gottman Institute. When we can see all of the other emotions and experiences driving the emotions we recognize, that can help us with our communication during conflict. All emotions serve a purpose or a function. We experience an emotion for a reason. However, we, how we express that emotion determines how the emotion functions or influences the conflict itself. For instance, instead of screaming because you're angry, if you can step back and say, I'm feeling disrespected or embarrassed right now, you are more likely to handle the conflict in a constructive manner. Expressing anger responsibly includes admitting that you're angry not attacking the other person in anger, figuring out what triggered the anger so you can deal with the issue, and not blaming or venting. 
Emotions affect a lot of things, so understanding them is key. Our bodies react physiologically to our emotions. Increased heart rate, a lump in your throat, tenseness, perspiration. Also, our emotions can cloud our judgment or interpretations. It might be difficult to think clearly and rationally when you are taken over by negative feelings, and certain emotions are even associated with certain behaviors. Feeling attacked? You might close yourself off or walk away from the situation. Others might attack back, trying to show dominance with their bodies. Importantly, we're not passive in these processes. With training, we can make choices during conflict episodes that help us utilize our emotions more constructively and keep us from acting out. Now, let's look at conflict types. Note that you recognize the content and relational dimensions from our book, but process conflict is not there. We will briefly touch on the first two dimensions, but be sure to look at the deeper explanations in our textbook. Content conflict is sometimes called task conflict. This dimension of conflict involves perceived differences of beliefs and values or perceived differences of opinion or ideas on what goals or problems to address and how to address them. Content conflict can, be, can sometimes be a good thing because content conflicts help people achieve a better understanding of task issues and therefore improve decision making. Relationship conflict refers to the participants' perceptions of their connection to one another. They might involve issues of esteem, control, or affiliation. This type of conflict involves factors that impact people's ability to maintain positive interpersonal relationships. For instance, this could be related to personality differences, communication incompetence, etc. There are some people that have trouble working together. In general, that can be a form of relationship conflict. These two dimensions are always bound together in human communication and provide a lens for looking at conflict. Content conflict is conflict about an issue of what's right and wrong, or where are we going to go? Relationship conflict is how people are connected to each other. Research also suggests another type of conflict, process conflict. This dimension is related to the logistics of accomplishing a task. With process conflict, the issue isn't about differences between people, values, or how to approach a goal. It's differences in how people accomplish that goal together. This is when conflict arises from disagreements over task division and responsibility. It could be conflict over differences with time management, scheduling, group contribution, or role. For instance, conflicts over social loafing or having issues finding a time for everyone to meet are process conflicts. All three dimensions together can increase potential for conflict. On its own, content or task conflict is less destructive because the focus is on the issue or value, not the relationship or process. Relational conflict can be very destructive because it's often tied to negative emotions like hostility or dislike. This can be destructive itself, but can also distract from task or process accomplishment. Process conflict can be a major issue because it can signal overarching disagreements and often involves relational conflict too. As we move into talking about conflict resolution, here's a quote to think about. Effective negotiators create a cooperative atmosphere and take the perspective of others. The most productive approaches to negotiation incorporate these two elements by viewing negotiation as a problem-solving process rather than as a competitive tug-of-war. Fisher and Urey, from research in 1981, present a step-by-step -step method of conflict negotiation. Principled negotiation emphasizes deciding issues on their merits rather than through competitive haggling or through excessive accommodation. Each principle focuses on one of the four basic elements of negotiation, people, interests, options, and criteria. First, we want to separate the people from the problem. By doing this, we become more attentive to our relationships during a conflict and avoid defining the situation as a test of wills. By focusing on the problem, it is not us versus them, but more of working together to figure out a solution. 
One way to help do this ahead of a conflict is to build trust with others. This can help diffuse strong emotions and keep a conflict from escalating. Next, focus on interests, not positions. Positions are the opposing points of view in a conflict, while interests refer to the relevant needs and values of the people involved. Another way to think about it is that a position is a public stance. An interest is the reason why that person takes that position. If you focus on positions, you and the other person might not see that there is room for agreement and there are multiple ways to meet the underlying interest. If you can, address interests and positions. That helps to make negotiation more authentic and move forward to problem solving. Third, invent options for mutual gains. Think of creative solutions that can benefit both parties. When both sides are sensitive to the other party's interests, you can make it easier to find solutions. But note, this step is impossible unless you engage in the first two steps of separating people from the problem and focusing on interests, not positions. Fourth, Fisher and Urey say that effective negotiation requires that objective criteria be used to settle different interests. This helps the solution seem wise and fair. The goal in negotiation is to reach a solution based on principle, not on pressure. And criteria helps that. Criteria can come in multiple forms. Precedent, professional standards, what a court would decide, moral standards, tradition, that means established practices, and scientific judgment. One example is fair procedure. For instance, parents might use a forced choice technique for siblings fighting over cake slices. The technique is one sibling cuts the pieces and the other gets the first choice of which slice to take. Interestingly, this forced choice technique was used by the United Nations and the law of the sea negotiations over deep seabed mining. Half of the sites were going to be mined by wealthy countries with private companies, the other half by the UN on behalf of poorer countries. Poorer countries knew less about the sites and were worried the private companies would pick the best ones for themselves. To move forward negotiations, the negotiators had the private firm pick two sites they wanted, and then the UN would select one for themselves. That gave the firm's incentive to pick two good or equal sites because they didn't know which one they would end up with. As you know, conflict doesn't just happen in a workplace. So sometimes it's helpful to look at conflict research from other fields and apply those principles to organizational conflict. John Gottman is a famous psychologist. He's one of the biggest interpersonal communication and relationship experts in the field. He runs the Gottman Institute and can predict with over 90% accuracy if a marriage will end in divorce by listening to an argument for three minutes. He explains that it isn't about if couples have conflict or not. It is how they talk or argue about that conflict that is the issue. He has identified four signs of a destructive relationship, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and they can transfer to organizational and leadership communication as well. These horsemen often follow in order of each other as the conflict escalates. First is criticism. This is likely the most common horseman. Criticism is when you complain about a person's character. Critical talk is usually filled with you statements because they are focused on the person, not the action. They also have always and never statements, which suggest a consistent negative component. For example, you never think about how your actions affect others. You can never get anywhere on time and don't care how much strain it puts on us to wait for you. Criticism can make the receiver feel hurt, attacked, and rejected. It can become a pattern of criticism that leads to the other horsemen. The antidote to criticism is what Gottman calls the gentle startup. It involves using complaints instead of criticism. While criticism focuses on character, complaints focus on the behavior or issue, which is healthy to voice a problem with. It doesn't have as much negativity because it isn't about blame, but instead communicating a need. Framing it this way helps the other person hear it. So, in a gentle startup, you want to make straightforward comments about an issue, use I statements, 
and express a need in a positive fashion. You use that I language and avoid you statements because you statements feel like you're blaming the other person. For example, say, arriving to the meeting late is becoming a pattern. It makes it really difficult for us to keep moving because we need the update from your team. Do you see the difference? Criticism leads to contempt. Contempt is a statement or nonverbal behavior that is intentionally mean. This looks like mocking another person, eye-rolling, name-calling, mimicking them. It conveys disdain for the other person and communicates superiority, like, I'm better than you, you're lesser than me. Contempt is powered by the buildup of long-held negative thoughts. It negatively impacts trust and cooperation and leads to more conflict rather than reconciliation. If we are sticking with the scenario where a coworker is late for a meeting, an example of contempt is saying, how hard is it to check your watch? Probably tricky when all you do at work is try to land a date with Alex in marketing. Pathetic. A short-term antidote for contempt is to describe your feelings and needs. Similar to the criticism antidote, focus on what you need and try to avoid blaming or attacking the other person. A long-term antidote is to build a culture of fondness and admiration. Try to focus on what this coworker does well. Appreciate gratitude for positive qualities and actions. Next, defensiveness is when you try to defend yourself from a perceived attack by being indignant or claiming to be the victim. This is often a response to criticism, contempt, and or a complaint. If we feel blamed or unjustly accused, we look for a way to defend ourselves. But this is often an attempt to redirect blame by saying, you're at fault, not me. This action escalates the conflict. Going back to the issue of being late to the meeting, defensiveness would look like, well, if you ever consulted me about a good meeting time, maybe I wouldn't be late. I can't believe you put this meeting at 10 a.m. You know I have a director's meeting right before. The main antidote to defensiveness is to take responsibility for your role in the situation, even if it is only for part of the issue. Doing so prevents escalation, and from there, people can work to a compromise. An example of taking responsibility is, you're right, I'm sorry, it's hurting the team. I have the director's meeting before this one, and it always runs long. I should have explained that to you when we plan the meeting time. Could we shift our meeting to 10.15 so I'll be on time, or put me later in the schedule? Finally, we have stonewalling, which is withdrawing to avoid conflict and convey disapproval, distance, and separation. In stonewalling, you may just shut down because you're emotionally flooded. This could be stopping listening or giving the other person the silent treatment. Stonewalling, which some people call gray rock, <laughs> can be very frustrating for the other person. It can make them infuriated. In work conflicts, we want to avoid stonewalling as much as we can. One way to do that is physiological self-soothing. This involves calling a timeout or taking a break from the discussion. This helps reduce the feelings of being overwhelmed by emotions. A 20 minute break helps your body calm down physiologically, but you have to focus on soothing in this time, not raging mentally against the other person. Finally, we're gonna look at conflict management styles. I'll briefly review them here and focus more on how situation impacts style choice. A conflict style is defined as a pattern response or behavior that people use when approaching conflict. There are five conflict styles that fall on two dimensions. You might note that these sound similar to the task relationship grid in Unit 1. First, assertiveness refers to attempts to satisfy one's own concerns, meaning your concerns for results or goals. Cooperativeness represents attempts to satisfy the concerns of others. Think of it as concern for relationships, people, and their interests. For a brief review, avoiding in the bottom left corner is both an unassertive and an uncooperative style. Those who favor the avoidance style will avoid communicating about the conflict by either delaying addressing the conflict or withdrawing, so they don't have to talk about it. 
they will seem disinterested in the conflict. Competition at the top left is a conflict style of individuals who are highly assertive about pursuing their own goals, but uncooperative in assisting others to reach theirs. This generally involves aggressive or competitive communication. Accommodation in the bottom right is an unassertive but cooperative conflict style. This is when you ignore your own needs or preferences and are more concerned with maintaining relationships. So you go with what the other person wants. This type of style downplays differences and involves people pleasing. Compromise in the middle involves both a degree of assertiveness and cooperativeness. Everyone gets something they want, but likely no one gets all of what they want. Finally, collaboration at the top right requires both assertiveness and cooperation. This involves creative solutions to meet everyone's interests. The book says it is the preferred style, but often it's not realistic. For instance, maybe there is not time to do it, or maybe there are scarce resources and people cannot get both get what they want because of scarcity. Or maybe it's a really trivial matter to you, and it isn't useful or time effective to collaborate. So accommodating might make more sense. People do have preferred ways of managing conflict, but people will also adapt to different styles when conflict isn't being resolved. Let's look at some situational factors that come into play when choosing a style. The importance of the task and timeline for decision making have great impact on conflict style. For instance, if the result of the conflict is trivial, avoidance might work as a solution. Or if it really matters to the other person but not to you, accommodation might make sense. However, when the goal outcome has more importance to you, collaborating, competing, and compromising might make more sense. Time pressure also impacts conflict style because styles like collaborating and compromising can take a lot of time. If you don't have the ability to deliberate, then those styles will not be used. Finally, other considerations play a role as well. You might ask yourself questions like, can I figure this out without the other party? How important is the relationship compared to reaching my goal? If I let the other person get their way, how does that impact me? Or do we need a break before I, we talk about this issue more? So when we think about conflict, there's a lot at play here. Before we move to our study guide, I wanted to leave you with one final thought. Conflict doesn't end when it's no longer visible. Because a decision has been made, one side is won, or the parties have moved on to other issues. Instead, conflict is resolved when the issues have been addressed to the satisfaction of everyone. If conflict has merely been suppressed or delayed, it's not actually resolved. How you handle conflict, how you work with and communicate with the other parties involved, is incredibly important. It isn't just about winning. That's why there is that relationship dimension. That's why considering emotions and what language you use matters. As you study conflict, think about how to manage it in all facets of your life. What we're learning crosses over from work to personal life. The more you can practice effective conflict management, the better you'll get at it and the more confident you'll become. Conflict is inevitable, but you can control how you talk about it, which can have a big impact in resolution.